An application I like thinking about, because it's easy to visualize in my mind, is given a flow rate, find a total, hmm, what should I call this? Is the flow rate a water flow rate? Is water flowing into a tank? It could be. But it also could be money flowing into your bank account. Does money literally flow into your bank account? Probably not. Though it does essentially flow into Amazon's bank account. <laughs> right? They're getting money every second of every day across the globe. It's like literally money is flowing into their bank account. Is it one bank account? I'm sure it's not. Many bank accounts spread all over the world. Of course, money's also flowing out because they have their costs. So the flow rate could be a, a flow rate of money. And then the thing we're trying to find is not a total volume of water, it would be a total change in money. Okay, well, let's, let's imagine it's water. into a tank, say, just to keep it simple. We want to find the total change in volume, which could be the same as the total volume itself if it starts off with no water. Water's flowing into a tank. If there's no water in there to begin with, then the total change in the volume of the water is the same as the volume itself. But if there's some water in there to begin with, then the total change adds on to that to get the total volume. That's starting in there. What kind of given would this be? It would be a function of T. Flow rate, what should I call it? Um, R of T, but it's not a position vector. No, I didn't put a little half arrow above it. Okay, that's not a vector. That's a function, an ordinary function of T. What's the total change in the volume? Delta V, the change in volume. Not change in velocity, change in volume. You find the total change in volume by integrating the flow rate. Over whatever time interval you're talking about, say T goes from A to B. To find the total change in volume, integrate the flow rate. Is this something I have to prove? Mm, depends on your perspective. We're certainly not going to try to prove it, but we do want it to make sense. And one way to make sense out of this is to imagine the units, to think about the units. If this is a flow rate telling you how fast water is flowing into the tank, like with the faucet, you could make it trickle in one drop at a time, or you could send a gusher in. You could really open it up the spout and it could be flowing in very fast. And it doesn't have to be a constant flow rate. You could be playing in the bathtub, turn that spigot back and forth, make it come in fast, then slow, then fast, then slow, then fast, then slow. It could be a function of T. What kind of units would it be? It would be units of volume per unit time, like gallons per minute, or maybe liters per second. Or maybe, nobody ever talks about centiliters, milliliters, milliliters per second. I mean, it depends on what units you want to use. This is liters per second, or if you prefer, 
liters per second, depending on what spelling you want, just like theater. Okay, liters per second, T is in seconds. You want, you want consistent units, T would be in seconds. Here's the way to conceptualize this, not to prove that it's true, but to have it make sense in your mind. Imagine R of T is, well, that, that integrated function, think about its units is centimeters per second, or not, <laughs> liters per second. Imagine DT is having units as well. What units? Units of time, because it's a small amount of time. Wait, is it? Is it a small amount of time? I thought it's just telling us what the variable is, right? T is the variable is what, what it means when we write dt. Integrate with respect to t. Well, guess what? Newton and Leibniz and many people after them have thought about dt as being a small amount of time. And that would be in seconds. S is seconds. Its units would be seconds. And then imagine R of T dt as being a literal multiplication. Is it a literal multiplication? No, it's not. But pretend. Why would I pretend in a math class? Because it's helpful, that's why. Don't think of it as rigorous math. When I would see my physics teachers talk this way, I'd be like, how do you know you can do that? Can you prove that? And they're like, what are you, a mathematician? They don't try to prove it. They just say it makes intuitive sense. I'm serious when I say this. It's like you're taking a small, a, a certain liter per second, a certain rate and multiplying by a small amount of time and the seconds would cancel to give you a quantity, R of T dt, that's in liters. R of T dt something in uh, liters per second getting multiplied by a small amount of time in seconds has units of liters, units of volume. You could call this dV if you like. You ever see these kinds of equations in physics books? dv equals r of t dt. This is a generalization of distance equals rate times time. That's like a distance, except it's a volume. That's like a rate. I mean, it is a rate, liters per second, a flow rate. And that's amount of time. Volume, change in volume is rate times time. And it is in liters here, ultimately. Well, what about going back to the integral, though? The integral is supposed to be like adding. I mean, after all, we've said the integral is a limit of Riemann sums, literal summations with capital sigmas. To find the total change in volume, what this equation is doing is it's saying add up the little changes in volumes. The dVs are the little changes in volumes. This is very hand wavy math. Don't think this is rigorous, okay? Don't go to bed at night saying, Dr. Kinney taught me rigorous math here. Hand wavy, intuitive, but still worthwhile because it helps you think about the meaning of integrals, how to interpret them, what their units are. You multiply the units of the function that you're integrating, the integrand, times the units of the variable. In this case, again, liters per second times seconds to get the units of the entire product, so to speak, R of T dt. And then the integral doesn't change the units because that's just adding a bunch of things that have the same units, liters. A bunch of what things? What are these dVs? They're just conceptual conveniences. I'm not being rigorous. Over the entire time interval from A to B, I imagine slicing that up into how many pieces? Well, essentially infinitely many pieces. All of length dt. How small is dt? Well, essentially infinitely small. 
In fact, DT is sometimes called an infinitesimal because of this. R of T is not infinitesimal. R of T might be like five, five liters per second. Pretty fast. Times a tiny amount of time gives you a tiny amount of volume. An infinitesimally small kind of amount of volume. What is this? Infinitesimal numbers? Infinitesimally small numbers? There are no such numbers. Or are there? I mean, is is 10 to the negative 1,000 power an infinitesimally small number? And no, it's actually not. It's much bigger than infinitesimally small numbers. Is 10 to the negative 10 million an infinitesimally small number? No, it's not actually. It's much bigger than infinitesimally small numbers. Infinitesimally small numbers are beyond your imagination in how small they are. How, how can such numbers exist? They don't. And you're right, they don't. They don't exist in the standard real number system. Really blow your mind. But there's a number system called the hyper real number system in which they do exist. What? I am being serious. I am not joking with you. There's a number system called the hyper real number. You thought things were bad with imaginary numbers and complex numbers. Hyper real numbers? Yeah, they actually exist. You can define them to exist, and they include infinitesimally small numbers. I'm going way overboard here. Don't, don't make this confuse you for the test next week. Okay, I'm not testing on this stuff. I'm alluding to it because people do think about these things, and they're pretty wild. And I'll maybe even share a video with, with you after class where somebody talks about this in more depth. But the point is, for you, is that in this application, the change in volume is found by integrating the rate of change, the flow rate. And that can be conceptualized this way. Imagine R of T times DT is giving you little changes in volume and imagine the integral adding those up to get the total change of volume. That's confusing. It's okay. We'll keep working now. And it applies in other situations. If R of T is a flow rate of money, integrating the flow rate of money gives you the total change in money. Integrating any kind of rate of change, any kind of derivative, gives you the total change. R of T doesn't have a prime by it, but it really is the derivative of something. I guess it's the derivative of big R, an, an antiderivative, capital R. I mean, I haven't written that down, but I could say capital R of T is an antiderivative of little t, R of T. And the change in volume really is the change in the antiderivative. If capital R is the antiderivative, this could be written as capital R of B minus capital R of A. And that difference would represent a change in volume. Maybe R of T itself is the volume. Maybe I want to write V equals capital R of T to give me my volume at time T. That would certainly be okay to do. And I could come up with examples where I have formulas for these things or graphs, and I could think about these things with those formulas or graphs. I hope you weren't sleeping the last 10 or 15 minutes. These things I've been saying are important for you. Your first set of problems for what's due Friday is going to involve thinking about units for integrals. What I've been saying is the key to that. In a nutshell, the unit for the integral is always the unit for the function you're integrating times the unit for the variable you're integrating with respect to. It's like a multiplication. And in this case, the seconds cancel, leaving you with liters. Another example the book alludes to is work done by a force. Units are a little different there. Time is not involved. Just give me 30 seconds here. If f of x is a, is a variable force, a force that varies with distance, units of newtons, and x is a distance, this has units of, say, meters, then the quote-unquote product f of x dx has units of newtons meters, newtons times meters, 
which is units of energy, joules. And the integral doesn't change the units. The final units for the integral is joules and it does represent something called the work done by the force. I always had a trouble thinking about work done by forces. So if you have trouble with work done by force, you're not alone. Dr. Kinney had trouble. And it's still kind of confusing me sometimes. It's simplest when the force is constant and then you don't actually have to do an integral. You can just multiply by the distance traveled to get the work done by the force. It's more complicated if the force varies with position, for example, which does happen in some physical situations like a mass and a spring going back and forth. The restoring force of the spring varies in strength according to the position of the mass. So to find the work done in that kind of situation, you have to do an integral. If you haven't have had physics, you might not really know about work done by a force. I mean, we're not going to make a big deal of it, but it does come up more significantly in Calc 2. Uh, 